born in East Jordan, Michigan, okay. on January 24th, 1922. So you just had a birthday. Yep. Wow, that's great. And in March that year, my, my dad's grandfather took ill, and he, had to, he quit his job in, he was uh, at the flooring plant. They made hardwood flooring in East Jordan. And his dad was a, was a help cut the timber up in the woods. So anyway, he had, he had to quit that job and him and mom and me went out to, it was about the middle of March, on, to the farm. And that was somewhere between uh, East Jordan and Ironton. Okay. And so uh, dad was there until spring and grandpa got better. So then uh, by that time, see, he had met my mother so uh, they were married, and so they de he decided to go back, not to go back to East Shore and to come to Charlevoix. Okay. And, uh, what did he do here? He took a job with uh, Roy Brady's. Uh, he ran a small marina for resort boats. Okay. And my dad took a job there, repair, engine repair. And then in later years, he, he leased the place where John Cross Fisheries is now okay. and started his own marina. And then summer times, it was good going, but then when it come winter, well, then it wasn't much doing. So he used to take a job with one of the crosses on the boats okay. for the winter for and the fish winter. till. And then when in after well, 1941, uh, there was no gasoline for any boat, so he he gave up the marina huh. and went full time fishing. Then, oh, that's interesting. That's how I got into fishing. See. Okay, because there would be enough gas for fishermen, but not for pleasure boats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so, so that was the beginning, and that would be. Uh, well, I'm see there again. I'm going to say probably 1942, really, when he got out of it, full, because see the war it was just getting underway. Sure. And so then, uh, did he get his own boat then, or did he? No. no then, then he went on one of the cross boats, okay. and th what they used to do is share fish. In other words, the boat took half, and then the crew split half. Okay. And if you had a big crew, or you know, that's how they split it. And so, but the crew used to, they got so that when he'd go on there. Uh, they didn't want an extra guy all the time, so my dad built his own nets, and they would set two two strings of his nets with theirs, and then he got the fish out of his, and that was that's how he he just that's all he got for wages, you know, or his living. Yeah. Can you describe those nets to us a little bit? What what were those nets like? Now there's there's one of the nets, and I was just I was hold it up in front of you. Go ahead. Yeah, just yeah, hold it up so I can hold it up see. Hold it up so yeah. he can see. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Now, I was on the, we were coming home from Beaver Island and there was some, we had a bunch of smelled or small fish that we didn't get out of the nets. Mm -hmm. So I was saying that, that was on the way home one day. Well, it was the day this picture's taken here about the fish. And were those gill nets or were those mm -hmm. trap nets? No, those were gill nets. Okay. okay. And how big were the squares in the gill nets? They had to be four and a half inches square. That was a, a law. The whitefish had to be uh, had to uh, be 17 inches long to be legal, and the lake trout had to be weigh a pound and a quarter. I don't know why they did, did went that way, but that let they, most of the fish that uh, smaller would go right through our right nets. Through the nets. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how they regulated it. Okay. Did you ever have to sort the fish? Did you get some small ones that would get caught? In we got very few because uh, uh, once in a while you get lake trout because they get caught by their teeth. Uh -huh. But uh, whitefish, they just swim along all the time. They, they, I don't know why they ever call them gill nests because you never see, you never see the nets in their gills. Okay. The, the lake trout have got their teeth hooked in them. Oh, and most of the lake trout we could let go after we got in to see it. Uh, once uh, they started planting trout, well, we couldn't take any. Uh -huh. We had to let, well, we could, any dead ones we could keep. Uh -huh. 
we had to, I don't know, 15 cents a pound or something, we had to pay the state, but we could only keep the dead ones. And then if you got, I don't know, it's been so long since I went through this, if you got a certain amount of fish, uh, lake trout, when you're lifting your whitefish nets, then you had to move. Oh. You couldn't set your nets back. That's how they regulated, tried to that way, so. Can you describe what it was like to set a net? What was it like when you put a set a net out on the water? Well, let's see. There's right there. Okay, go ahead and I'll show it to me. Hold it up so you can. Yeah, just show it like that. That's great. Okay. And then I'll describe it to you if I can. Okay, go ahead okay. and describe it. No, okay. I got it. Well, do you see where? We're, this is the back of the boat, looking this way now. Yeah. And I'm doing what I call spinning the nets. I let them, these have already been lifted and the fish taken out. Okay. The, and and then my dad was back here. See, I, I don't have a picture of that either. And he would take the, the one line had had a float on it. Okay. And the other one had a piece of lead to, uh, right opposite that so that it floated the net up. Okay. And he'd just stand there and just make sure that the 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 cork line, as we called it, was was uh, untangled. Okay. Uh, and so. Did they have weights that would hold the bottom of the net down? They had leads. Okay. Originally, when they started around Beaver Island, I, I was going to tell you this too. They used to call floating stones. Okay. They took pieces of cedar and tied them on the, the cork, or what we call the cork line, and then they put a piece of stone on the, tie it on the bottom to hold it down. Hold it down, and then um, that would make, so there was kind of like a, a wall of net under right. the water. It, I'll tell you what it was, it's just like a fence. Okay. In a, that's what, what it would remind you of. Okay. The fish would swim into it, and then mm -hmm. you'd get, they'd get caught, and yep. you'd gather them up. Yep. Sometimes, sometimes we get there, sometimes we didn't give anybody. No, there we go. That's how they, uh, and then we used to, you'd start one place, and the, the bottom of the lake is just like our land. There's hills, hills and stuff. And, but usually they, they run north and south and they're long. We got one out here we call a big reef, and that's about eight miles. Wow. You know, you can get shallow on one side. When you leave Charlevoix and you get out, you go deep water, and then you get shallow and you go over that, and then you get deep water out where we, out where the steamboats run. Okay. So when you set, you find out about where you lifted the nest previous, that day. You, you watch to see where you got the most fish. Because you'd start in, oh, either deep or shallow, one or the other. If you started in deep water, well, then you, went up shallow and then turned, and we set these all in a string. Okay. And if you got your arithmetic, our nets were 1,200 feet long to a box. That's what we call, we put three nets in a box, and we used to set 10 of them wow. in a string. But you just wind in and out, just mm -hmm. zigzag up and down the bank, we called it. Okay. So that's how we set them, and then I guess, where do we go from here? <laughs> so, Well then, about how many pounds of fish would you take at, uh, with that many, that much net set? I've, I've got as high as, uh, as low as 120 pounds, I guess, and I've got as many as 6,000. Wow, so. <laughs> 6,000 Yeah, but, but it's, it's rare. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the 40s, that, from what I was reading, that was rare by then. Yeah, oh yeah, yep. When I come home in 45, I was home on leave from the Navy, and uh, that's, that's when my dad and I bought the boat, the first boat. When I, we bought it while I was home on leave, I had to go back. I had to take a bunch of recruits from, uh, that were home on leave out of Great Lakes. And I had to take them back out to uh, San Diego to the destroyer base. And so then uh, I come back. I got home New Year's Eve on 45. Oh, good for you. Just what? at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, got in on the afternoon train, so. Oh, well, you were ready to celebrate that night, weren't yeah, you? Yeah. That was the year, I was going to tell you, that year that the lake trout always in November was spawning time, and that's when Booth, they just, every boat had five, 6,000 pounds of fish, see. Okay. In November? It, 
Well, that was, uh, we couldn't fish, uh, you, you couldn't fish lake trout from the 10th of October to the 10th of November. Okay. That was a closed season. Well, so then at the 10th of November, well, then they would all, and they all, there was always a few spawn fish that hadn't spawned yet. And that's when they would get into them, you would get. But anyway, in 45, the biggest lift came in Charlevoix was just a little over 6,000 pounds. And it was uh, my uh, cousin, Willis Cross, had that, that lift. And the next year, that would be 46, when I was, by then we were fishing, the biggest lift that came into booths was 300 and some pounds. Wow. That's how quick they went. Well, the Lamfreyes were just, they, well, some of the fish you couldn't even save. They'd have eight or nine holes sucked right in, in the lake trout, you know. So. When did you first start seeing the lamprey? Well, we didn't see any, well, it was while I was gone in service. Okay. That's when they really, well, apparently when they opened the Welland Canal, that let the fish come into Lake Ontario. Okay. And they just, uh, the biggest share of them stayed there until they cleaned that lake out. And then they moved up to, to Lake Erie. Okay. Then they moved to Lake Huron. And then all of a sudden they came into Lake Michigan. And apparently, uh, for some reason, where the water was too cold, they never hit Lake Superior that bad. Uh, maybe they couldn't get through the locks. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> maybe. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow, that was a big, a quick decline. Yeah, they, uh, so it, there was a, a lot of other things went with it. Uh, we got blamed, commercial fishing got blamed for it, but it, it wasn't. Uh, if you trailed what happened to the lake, you can see there was a lot more. And it's the same old story. They were putting more fertilizer in and dumping our trash in. They, you know, back then they just hauled it out and dumped it. You know, get it in the lake. Yeah. And they, that, uh, to say nothing of sewage, too. Yeah. 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 And see, all that stuff covers up, that's part of it is, uh, it don't kill the adult fish, but it covers the bottom so that the feed for microscopic stuff, that the little ones, when they got, uh, I don't know, they were, they're that long when they hatch out of an egg. Really? Wow. No, it just, and, uh, so they don't have anything to feed on, only stuff in the, fine stuff out of the water, and it just, all of a sudden, it's covered up, and it, and, and so that's probably, you know, a lot to blame. The fine stuff out of the water, and it just, all of a sudden, it's covered up, and it, and, and so that's probably, you know, a lot to blame. Yeah, you're right. That but, makes good sense. Uh -huh. Have there been good years and bad years? Is it still? Oh yes, uh, okay. uh, weather weather had a lot to do with it, and then you would get the spawning season. Especially if you got the right kind of a storm, it would uh, wash the eggs out in the deep water, or the uh, the fish would be chased off their spawning grounds and uh, go out in deep water and spawn. Then there would be no uh, hatch out there. So there was we had ups and downs. Uh, Tell the story about how your your brothers got. You said that your dad would buy a boat, and then once he paid for that, then your brother would get it, or your cousin, or something. You told oh, me grandpa! No, my yeah, grandpa. Your grandpa. Okay. Tell yeah. us that story. Yeah, he grandpa Cross was. Uh, well, he started out. He was <laughs> captain of a schooner. I told that part. Yeah, go ahead. And uh, so he he was all he had his own schooner. Walhalla was the name of it, the schooner. And he hauled f uh, f f a lot of stuff for the more, um, not Mormons, uh, Israelites out of St. Joel. Now, uh, when I say Joel, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was St. Joel, where the headquarters were. Okay, that would have been it, down south, mm -hmm. right? Southern Lake Michigan. And, they had a penal colony on High Island that they used to send the, the young males up there that misbehaved, and they had, they had hay and you know, apples. And then when Grandpa Cross would, the reason he got around Beaver Island, I guess, is he, they, he had jobs come up there and haul their stuff. Okay. And so, uh, that's where he got to know Beaver Island. 
So then he went in the fishing business himself up there, but it was, I, I, I can remember him telling me about that one, calm days, and he had the schooner, how do you set nets, <laughs> you know? And then you get out on the lake and you set fair wind and how you get back, and uh, that was quite a chore, so. So do you uh, know about when this was? Pardon? Do you know when it was, the eight, late 1800s, or? Yeah. Early? When was Grandpa Cross go when did he take his schooner to Beaver Island? Was it uh, I see probably I could, about nineteen hundred? Did we figure oh, earlier? Oh earlier than that? that had to be, yeah. Okay. Eighteen seventies or eighties? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I don't remember any of the schooners at all. Yeah. Do you I know? have I have some pictures at home of schooners laying in Charlevoix, but see I don't remember any of them. Yeah. So when but what was the story about how he'd buy a bull? Well, he he would he had all these boys. Mm -hmm. Did I bring that picture of the family? Yeah, it's right there, right by your ankle. Well, you, you can see the boys that he. Go ahead and hold, hold on. on. So I mean, yep. just just stand where you are. Just yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's good. Okay, and then tell us what happened. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this was taken at Grandma's funeral. Now that would be 1932, I think, because I remember going down to. Ludington, she passed away. Okay. And this is where the whole family was. Okay. So you can see the boys that he had. To, yeah. So as they get old, you know, older, he'd he'd have he he string nets mm -hmm. and uh, he have a guy come along and he kind of he made the boys give him a share back when he'd give them the boat and nets. Okay. So he would start the next one, and that's how that he uh, got all his boys into it. Is it's so in the fishing, okay. In the fishing, yeah. And show us a picture of your boats that you owned when you were in it. Oh. And when did you get this boat? This is the boat here, our boat. The other one belonged to Wards. Okay. You know where Wards are? Yep, Sunny Don. Sunny Don. Yours is Hazel M. Hazel W. Hazel W. Sorry. Okay. And when did you get that boat? 1960. So you were probably in fishing, you know, right after the war, 1945, <laughs> for a good 20 years. Then? 30 years. 30 years. Okay. 45. I I went through for oh I don't know what the state was. DNR were calling me. I had a good friend that uh, Warren Shapton. I don't know if you've heard of the Shapton at all. Anybody. He was deputy director of the DNR, and he and I were good friends. And we were having a hassle over cutting out the gill nets. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we, I dug it through all my old records and everything. And as far back as I could go, I averaged 188 days a year on the lake. Huh. And that for 30 years, for and that's years. almost 6,000 times. Wow. So that was how many times I was. We were out there. Oh, uh, yeah. 188 yeah. days a year. Yeah. Well, tell us your best day and maybe one of your worst days. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I had uh, lots of days when I had, I say lots of days, uh, through the years. Almost every year I had, I would have a day where I'd get 3,000 pounds of fish. Wow. And sometimes you wish you didn't because it was blowing and hard. When the wind was, it was a, a job to get the whole, you know, keep the boat, get the fish out of the nets and stuff. So, how did you get the fish out of the nets? Well, we just on. Well, we we had what we call a clearing hook. It was a little had a hand, a little handle on them. We made our own. Okay. And and you just hook and just look, you don't break that net, net. You just you just untangle them, back them out. Usually you back them out backwards. Okay. Now a whitefish, if they were just, if they were legal, barely, you could punch her and let the air out of them because they always, they always blow it up when they, uh, when you come up out, bring them up out of that deep water. Huh. And then you just punch her and then you could pull them right on through. Oh, okay. That would be easier and, and, and then when we fished chubs, that was late, that, that was a smaller fish. They smoked them. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty near every one of them, you just punch her and pull through. How many people were on the boat? How many? Oh, from two to four. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, I'm going to say the biggest share of our, uh, my fishing was, was just my father and I. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We just work like, well, I won't say it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we, we you worked had, hard, well, really hard. I'll tell you one thing, when we had the new boat built, everything was made to be easier than it was in the old days. And the boat handled good, two guys can operate it. Yeah. And uh, see, most boats, you know, like the Jackie there, they had to have three guys because they had a guy up in the pilot house to steer the boat, yeah. and then one guy to spin and one guy to spread. Yeah. So they had to have three all the time. So a lot of years, after, I'm going to say, the last 10 years I fished, uh, we, we, we didn't, my dad and I didn't try to do it alone for him. Okay. We, we always had three. He had three people. And then in, if we were fishing chubs in the fall when they were plentiful, we used to have four men on the boat too. So it varied. It seems like, did you haul those nets in by hand or with a No, winch? no, we had a machine. Machine, yeah. I was going to say, I can't imagine hauling all that fish in. No, Wait, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't have a... Okay. Can you... We, on this, this up in here opened up again. Okay. And then we had a, a what we call a roller. It was the p machinery that went out. Okay. And then, then there was another inside. There was a round one set this way that went around, and the nets come in here, see, and went right. Around. They didn't go all the way around. They they dropped off on okay. a um, on the table we had there for the. So we. Uh, you had some help. Oh, yeah, well, we and we when we had the boat built, why we had it built so that it was uh, handy. Yeah, had all those improvements. improvements. <laughs> so you started fishing in November. How long would you fish until the lake froze, or how? Uh, yeah, as a rule, we we usually quit about the first week in February. So all January. Wow. January and yeah, we used to fish all of January. So it's uh, cold. Well, well, we're enclosed and had heat. We had a, we burned coal, but it was a heat. You know, we had lots of heat. I mean, it was, and usually you're busy enough to stay warm. Right. But, yeah. and then uh, the only, only the front end was open for when you're lifting, and then we closed that all up so that when you open the back, why it wasn't like you had the whole boat open. But you'd still have storms, wouldn't you? Hmm? Would you get some storms coming in? Some oh storms? well, we went out. Pretty good weather. <laughs> so. Did you have a, a good weather reporting during the 50s and 60s? Never bothered about that. You never did? Okay. No. Nope. <laughs> You'd have gone broke if you listened to the weather man. Uh, you know, but, but no, usually um, I always got up and checked the weather. And a good, good thing was you know, we used to watch the leaves on the tree and, uh, you know, but I always go, if, even if they looked like they were wiggling a little bit, well, we used to, I used to drive down and check the weather at the, over here at the hill, you know. Mm -hmm. Because it, it all depended on where you had to go to lift your nets. You know, if the wind was east, well, I could go one place.